Good morning, folks. I'd like to welcome you to Journey. Would you please stand today as I open us in prayer for worship today? Father, I am so grateful for the folks that have gathered today in your name. We unapologetically come to celebrate your greatness. Lord, I pray that our hearts would come in alignment with the things that we sing and say right now. I pray that joy would just ooze out of us, Lord, that it would just bust out of us because we're just so grateful for how good you are. Lord, we see your goodness today. May we respond to that goodness with thanksgiving and joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, church. It is a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord, amen? All right, we are all children of God. Let's do it. Come on.
y'all, this is a this is such a good Sunday. I am so excited to be here. Some of y'all might be wondering, well, who is this girl up here? <laughs> um, and uh, I feel like I'm in this unique position today of kind of introducing myself to y'all and um, kind of trying to be open and authentic with who I am, but also always first and foremost point to Jesus because that's who it's about. Amen. And he is so good, y'all. He is so good to us. We just, there are not enough words for every single thing that we have and just the gratitude that I hope is pouring out of you today. Even if you're in a dark place in this room today, if you have, we all have things going on, but if you have some darkness in your life or if you have questions or doubt or anything like that, gratitude instantly just focuses your eyes on where everything comes from, and that's from him.
sing it softly one more time and just really reflect on that. Pray with me, Journey. God, what a beautiful, beautiful thing it is to, to come before your throne and just to raise your name up. You are such a good God. Your grace is more than what we can describe and more than we deserve, and we thank you for being a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of restarts and renewal. Father, we thank you for being a God who chases us and brings us home. We thank you for being a God who, who just won't quit. Today, Father, we ask we ask that your spirit come and that your spirit overwhelm us, that he remind us just exactly who you are and where it is that we find ourselves. And fill us up with joy of being home with you. It's in Jesus we pray. And the church said, amen. amen. You yeah, obviously, well, this morning, I want to I wanna take just a second uh, to officially introduce you guys to Holly. Y'all give her a hand. Thank you. Thank you. So I've been sick this week. And uh, so I am, I uh, guess, a, a little bit more raw than normal. But Holly, we, uh, we've been in a conversation for a little while, but I was uh, thinking this week about this moment and thinking about how we got here and realized uh, that until a couple of months ago, you and I had only had maybe a five or 10 minute conversation and that was 10 years ago. Uh, That's true. So how did, how did we get here? You know, it's, uh, it's a crazy um, set of circumstances. So uh, I'm trying to think of how to order all of this. My name's Holly Brenner. I, I've been married to my wonderful husband, Spencer, down here for about a year and a half now. Um, but I'm actually a country music singer by trade. And so I go by Holly Tucker in that world. And um, I actually came to know about Journey, even though I'd been here 10 years ago, I came to know about it again through my guitar player, y'all may know him, Mason Hayes. And uh, he told me about how wonderful this church is and just how welcoming everybody is and the spirit about this place. And um, when I found out that, that he was um, going to New Mexico, I had asked him, well, I mean, do you think Journey might be interested in accepting me? Do you think they might you know, maybe, possibly, um, <laughs> try me out. And because um, I, as a country artist, I mean, I've, I've been just about, you know, everywhere that you could, every kind of venue that you could think, but I grew up singing in the church. That was my start. And I've never left that either. I've always been singing in a church while I've been doing country music. So my faith and my music have always been kind of intersected. And so I just thought that it might be a really, really good fit. Um, I'm trying to be open to, to all of the doors that, that God has for me and, um, and just be faithful to that. And so when this opportunity came along, I really just wanted to jump on. There was something in me that was pushing me towards it. And that's how we got here. <laughs> 
I want to tell you, uh, Journey, I've been in conversation with, I can't tell you how many potential worship candidates. And um, when Holly and I met uh, for coffee uh, for the first two hours, um, I left that conversation just with this, huh, that was different. And it, uh, it's just like, well, <laughs> there was just a, a, a spiritual maturity in her, a calm presence, and a love for people that don't know our God. And then the girl can sing. <laughs> So one of the things that we've talked about was just the overwhelming piece that, that you had as well. You want to speak to that for, for just a second? Yes. Um, there have only been, I don't know if y'all know this, but the music industry is kind of tumultuous. It's like a roller coaster <laughs> and it's mostly, you know, heartbreaking moments. Um, but in the good moments, it's, it's really good. But at the same time, there's only been a few times in my life where I've ever experienced that unexplainable peace from God. And I can specifically name out each of those times. This was one of those for me. Um, it's a situation where maybe it might not make sense to some other people who, you know, know me outside of church and they only know me for country music. And, uh, I, you know what? It's not, it's not up to them to understand. It's up to me to follow where God's taking me. And I take that very seriously. And I think that's why I had that unexplainable peace. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I, and I've been, I've been visiting here, um, every couple of, uh, weeks, you know, and trying to just see and, and meet people and, um, just, just, uh, really get into the, the spirit of this place. So who won the where's Waldo game? Who, who noticed that she showed up like six times this summer? Is <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I wanted to see exactly what everything was about. I had to see it for myself, yeah. even though I had that peace. And every time I would walk through these doors, I had that sense again. It was just that unexplainable peace. So, well, we're going to get back to praising God. Uh, I do want to point out Spencer. He's Holly's husband. Y'all make sure to to grab him today as well. Um, but let's pray together, uh, church, and let's let's get back to focusing on him. God, thank you. Thank you for being an amazing God. May you receive all glory and all praise from all that we do. And Jesus, let your kingdom come. It's in your name we pray. Amen. As we get ready to sing this song, I pray that you'll really listen to the words and the spirit of it. Because no matter what else is going on or who someone is or is not or whatever, at the end of the day, it is just all about Jesus. That's why we're here. We come to fall at his feet in whatever circumstance we're in. So sing it with us.
just take a moment to let the spirit really move and work in this room and speak to everybody's hearts today. We don't know what God has for us a year down the road, a month down the road, even tomorrow. We don't know what God has in store, but we know that we can trust him because he works all things for good.
Jesus, we do, we come to you today completely open and surrendered to what you have for us. God, please move in us today. Whatever you want us to hear, help us have ears to hear it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. There's a few things that I feel like I learn very, very quickly, and then there's most things where I feel like I do not learn very quickly, and the Lord tends to over and over have to remind me of those lessons, and one of the things that has been a constant theme in the four and a half years of Beck and I being married is just uh, being stressed, whether that's about money or provision or health or whatever it may be, uh, and we always tend to freak out. And then get to the place of like, wait, the Lord has taken care of us before and he'll take care of us again. He, uh, he has sustained us up until now and he'll continue to do so. And that is just something over and over again that we have to remind ourselves of. And so in this moment, we're going to 
pray over our tithes and offering. And this is something that always has been hard for me. I'm always someone that there could always be a little bit more in the savings account, and it's hard to give that over. And part of this is because I feel like, are we going to have enough? And I have to remind myself, the Lord provides. And so I'm going to read from Psalm 121, which is in a section of the Psalms called the Psalm of Ascent. And the Psalms of Ascent are Psalms 120 to 134. And what these Psalms were, were these, these were songs that the people of God would sing as they made their way into Jerusalem. And they're called the Psalms of Ascent because Jerusalem is up on a hill. And so quite literally, they're going up in altitude. They're hiking up on top of the mountain to go to the place of worship and offer their sacrifices. And we have a few things in common, but we don't have a few things in common as well. We, like the Israelites, would go to the place of worship, and we would be expectant. Uh, But here's where we're different, is when they went to the temple, part of what they brought was an animal sacrifice. Because for them, in order to be made right with God, they needed the blood of an animal to cover their sins. But I have some good news for us this morning. When we come into the place of worship, the blood of Jesus has already been covered. And so our offerings that we come and we bring is not to make us right with God, but it's out of a place already being made right with him. And out of joy and thanksgiving, we get to give to him. And so whether these words are like, oh my gosh, I believe every word, or maybe you're someone in the group like, I hope these words to be true for me. I'm going to read these words over you. And then after, we're going to have a QR code and moment of silence. So listen to these words. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Join me in silence before you pray. Lord, like the Israelites, we come to the place of worship with our offering. Um, But we're thankful that unlike them, we are already made right with you. There's nothing that we can do to make you love us more or less. There's nothing that we can do, and Romans says, that can separate us from the love of God. And so out of that joy and gratitude, we humbly give back to you what is already yours. We want to be a people that takes care of each other, both inside these walls and outside these walls. And Lord God, would you use this money and our time and our talents to bring men, women, and children to come to know and love you. We expect these things and we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you are in fifth or sixth grade, you can head on back to the back. What a beautiful morning to be in the presence of God with the people of God, am I right? I can't wait to get going. You're just going to have to, I wish, I wish these seats had seat belts because you're going to have to buggle up. In uh, 2021, in the fall of 2021, we launched off into a four-year vision that we called Transforming 500 Lives. And I want to be very, very clear that when we talk about transforming 500 lives, we're not talking about having 500 people sitting in these seats between these two services. What we're talking about is having 500 lives visibly, tangibly, in real time changed. The language that we've used is that we become people who think and act like Jesus. 
one of the ways that we've described this over the past couple of years is that we will become known outside of these walls. We will become known, and I want to say are being known right now by relationships that, that transform disconnected people into people who think and act like Jesus. And when we say disconnected people, what, all we're talking about are, are people that, that are not in relationship or not connected with God or, or not connected with the people of God. People who may know him, but not sure that they want to have anything to do with church. If that's you, welcome. <laughs> that's the water we swim in. When we jumped into this conversation, it, it really boils all of our life down to the core essentials of what Jesus says that our life is about. Loving God and loving people. As we grow in our love for him, that influences and affects everything that we are, we end up offering his heart and his nature and his love to the thing that he loves the most. His kids in the world. Especially those who don't know him yet. That's what this transforming 500 lives thing is really all about. It's where we've been going for two years, and today marks the start of year three. And I want to take just a second to take a, a look back to where we were, where we've been, the ground that we've covered, because we haven't left those things. In fact, we're doubling down on the things that we've done over the last two years. We talked about four mountains that we're going to climb over these four years. And, and basically what we're talking about is like opportunities and challenges that we need to conquer in order to be this kind of people. And our first mountain was community multiplication. What we, what we talked about was we need to we need to leverage opportunity for relationship, like real relationship with people. We need to be a, a church family that has enough capacity, enough opportunity for relationship that every person we meet, whether it's inside these walls or outside these walls in the city, every person we meet, there's an opportunity to invite, invite them into transforming relationships with the people of God. Like we're never full. We're constantly looking for divine appointments. And so we needed to multiply our communities, and we did. Year two, oh, by the way, there you go. Underneath the TVs, there are these cards that point to communities. By the way, we're launching our communities September the 10th this year. We are in the prep stage. We're getting our community pastors ready, and we're getting ready to roll. September the 10th, stay tuned. Year two, we didn't leave that. That's where we're living, but we added to that. And what we, we, we moved to, into spiritual formation is mountain number two. And what we talked about there is like learning to live in regular practices and conversations that will help us be, be changed by Jesus. Like living in constant exposure to him. And we didn't print the shirts, but we're going to print the shirts, I promise. We're gonna get some shirts that say, be with Jesus. Like, that's where life is. Be with him. Amen. 
Think like Jesus. Act like Jesus. And we're done. That's what spiritual formation is. Say it with me. Be with Jesus. Think like Jesus. Act like Jesus. And so we, we dialed into living a life that has margin. We talked about how to live in a Sabbath kind of life. You guys sent me on you know, like one of the best gifts and greatest struggles of my ministry career. You sent me on a two month sabbatical. You guys are crazy. <laughs> and God's so good. We got to be with him. We got to stop to be with him. And we, we talked about how to do that and schedule your life to say no to other things so that you can rest in his presence. We talked about learning to pray. We talked about reading scripture. And if we build our life around those three foundational pillars, we will be with Jesus and we will begin to think like and act like him as well. And we gave you a simple tool and it is, there's, there's those cards in the back as well. Uh, if you don't have one, if you don't know what this is, grab one of these on the way out. It will, you can just follow it as a script, but we can sit down and have a conversation with you about how to have life-changing conversations where we talk about look back, look up, look forward. You remember? Right? We look back about where we've been, like where we are right now with God. We look up about what we're hearing from God through prayer or through scripture or through other relationships. And we talk about looking forward about what are we going to do about it? We're not just gaining more information. We are becoming different people. So what are you going to do? We haven't left those things. This is who we're going to be. This is what we are becoming. But I want to tell you, we're just getting started. Because what we're going to do today, oh, <laughs> it's like right in the center of the heart of God. But before we get there, Let's celebrate for a second. Let me tell you on this journey what God has already done. Our prayer and expectation is that by the time these four years are up, we will see more than 500 lives transformed. Let me show you what he's done already. Since we began, this little church family has seen 75. <laughs> 75 people come to Christ in baptism. 75. We've seen 180 new registrations in community. That's people raising their hands saying, I need transforming relationship in my life. I need somebody to walk with me. I need somebody to know my story. I need somebody to call me when things are going bad. 180 new registrations in community. How about that? We've seen 63 of us begin to serve in brand new ways. In the children's ministry, in our welcome center, in the kitchen, in JSM, as in communities, 63 of us saying, yeah, me too. And we've also seen 37 new leaders. And what we're talking about is people saying, I want to give my life away. I want to become a community pastor. I want to start a new ministry. 37 new leaders. You put those numbers, you can clap for that. 
you put those numbers together, we have seen already, go to the next one, 355 people transformed to think and act like Jesus. Journey, what we're talking about is not like head knowledge stuff. What we're talking about is us becoming a different kind of people. Us sacrificing for the good of others. Us pouring our lives out to watch Jesus and his kingdom reign. And it brings us to year number three. Disconnected by it. And I want to tell you that this mountain, this mountain is right in the center of the heart of God. This is what keeps God up at night. It's what he celebrates. It is the very essence of Jesus. So let's begin. God, as we move in, as we have this conversation, we want to ask you, to just do your thing, to have your way with us. And Father, and when there, if there are things, because I know there are, there are in me and there are in us, if the things in us that resist and have excuses and push back, God, just break it. because you're too important and your way's too good. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Luke 15. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. There's two things here. They understood sinners to be unworthy of God. Do you hear that? Do you understand? They understood those who lived in rebellion to God to be unworthy of God. And therefore, when applied to Jesus, a teacher of the law, a rabbi, for him to have association with them was for him to be discredited along with them. That his words had no value and credibility, that his very life was tainted and destroyed because of his association with those who were unworthy of God. And so Jesus teaches three different stories that are the bullseye of God's heart to address this. And he uses their language. And so he says, suppose one of you, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and one of them is lost. Would, would you not go out and leave the 99 and go and search for the one? 
And when you find it, wouldn't you throw it on your shoulder with joy and bring it back home and call your friends and your neighbors together and say, come rejoice with me. Because I found my lost sheep. He turns to the Pharisees, and I can see him look them at them in the eye with this mixture of compassion and anger, right? He says, I tell you in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Jesus is saying, rather than the sinner being unworthy, the sinner, the one who is in rebellion to God, is the one who God determines as the greatest value in his kingdom. Why? Because he doesn't have the kingdom. And God looks at his kid and he's like, no. I will move heaven and earth to bring him back home. There's nothing that I long for more. And so instead of association with the sinner removing credibility, running after the one in rebellion actually puts you right in the heart, in the nature, in the character of God. Being in the wrong places with the wrong people at the wrong times makes you more like God than any good church Bible believing believer. And the religious may not like it. He turns and he says, well, how about this? Suppose a woman has 10 silver coins. She loses one. Wouldn't she sweep her house carefully, looking everywhere to find it? And when she finds it, won't she call all of her neighbors to her house and say, come, rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. I tell you the truth. There will be more rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Journey, we know how to rejoice. China Spring has uh, had some opportunity to rejoice the past couple of years. Am I right? I got one amen and one who. (laughs) Am I right? My son has just entered high school. And we better not be done winning some state championships. I'm just saying. We've won two football state championships and a baseball state championship this past year. And I have watched you guys. I know you've been watching me too, and that's okay. But I have watched you guys act a fool when that stuff is going on. Like there is some, you end up sounding like I sound today at the end of that game, right? There's just screaming and jumping up and down and hugging people you've never seen before. You know, it's that thing. (laughs) 
Now take that image and move it into heaven. It's what Jesus is saying the angels are doing for us. When men, women, and children come home who do not, who had not known him before. There's nothing in heaven that creates more of a championship celebration than that. And then he has the real message for the teachers of the law. He says, suppose there's this man. He has two sons. And the younger son asks for his inheritance early. And so the father divides up his property and, and gives it to the two sons. And the younger son takes his inheritance and takes it to a, a far distant land and squanders it with wild living. And while he's there, a great famine breaks out. So severe that there is not any food. And he hires himself out to work in the fields and to work with feeding the pigs. And over time, he longs to just feed himself with the pods that the pigs would eat. But no one would give him any food. And over time, he comes to his senses and he turns and he thinks about his father and he thinks about his father's servants and he understands and he knows my father's servants have, have food to eat and they never go hungry. And here I'm starving. But I'm no longer worthy to be called a son of my father. I'll go back and I'll ask to be a servant. And so he stands up and he starts making his way on the long journey home back to his father. And his father sees him from a distance and runs out to meet him. And when he meets him, he throws his arms around his son. And he kisses him. And the son turns to his father and he says, Father, I've, I've sinned against you and I've sinned against heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Rather, make me, make me your servant. The father turns as if the son hadn't even said anything. He turns and he calls his servant and says, Quick, come, put a robe on my son. Put a ring on his finger. Kill the fattened calf. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son, my son, who was dead, has now been found. And they began to celebrate. The older son was out in the fields, and he heard the commotion. And he came and he asked one of the father's servants, what's going on? What, why all the noise? And the servant said, your younger brother has come home. Your father has killed the fattened calf and he's throwing a, a party for him. The older brother became angry, refused to go in. And so the father runs out to the older brother and begs him to come in and celebrate. The older brother turns to the father and he says, says, Father, I have never left you. For years I have slaved for you and you have never once treated me like this. You've never once even given me a young goat to celebrate with my friends. And this this son of yours comes home, throwing things. 
Told you you need to buckle up. This son of yours comes home? This one who has who has squandered everything of yours with prostitutes? He comes home and you you do this for him? The father says, my son, you've always been with me. And everything that I have is yours. But this brother of yours was dead. Now he's alive again. He was lost. And now he's found. Disconnected buy-in journey. The brother turns and says, this son of yours, Father turns it back to him. He says, this brother of yours. You see, Jesus reveals the heart of God by showing you what he's truly passionate about. By showing you his value system. The question is for us, will we join him in it? Will we reflect the greatest desire of God or will we reject his heart and how he views people? One of the truest expressions of love that you can have for me or anyone you meet is to love what they love. Kristen has learned to love Cowboys football with me. (laughs) I have learned to love home renovations with her. But none of you can love me any better than loving my kids and loving my wife. And as we grow in our love for God, we will love what he loves. We will love people especially those who haven't come home yet. See, Journey, this has always been who we are. Our vision at Journey is this, that we are walking with disconnected people in transforming community as we become like Jesus. It's who we've always been. It's time for us to own it. So we're about to move back into worship and I wanna invite the band back up. And as they come, I want to invite us to put this stuff on our lips. So y'all please stand up with us. Journey. Transforming lives is not about just reaching people outside of these walls. Transforming lives is about you and me. It's about you and me being changed into the image of God so much that it impacts others. And so we're going to go through a bunch of different phrases, and I will read the first line, and then we together are going to read the, the line underlined. You understand that. That was a word salad, but you got it. Right? All right. 
Let's do it together. It's about us becoming like Jesus in how we think and act. It's about us loving our friends and neighbors who aren't connected to God. It's about us celebrating with reckless passion when one person comes home. It's about us being the safest place for people with questions, hurts, and struggles. It's about us changed by the heart of God so much that we run to joy with them. I read it wrong, you read it right. You run to them with joy. It's about us being known as a people who love God radically and love people recklessly. It's about us becoming a people who lay our lives down for the good of each other and for the good of our city. It's about us learning to see people through Jesus' eyes. It's about us learning to speak with the grace of God. It's about us learning to give our time, our energy, our money for other people. It's about us finding joy and sacrificing our lives and celebrating the power of the kingdom of God breaking into Waco. And the church said, Amen. we're going to close in worship and communion. And as we do, what we do in communion is we participate and we celebrate our reconciled relationship with God through Jesus. The work of the cross and the work of the empty tomb in our flesh because he is in us. We eat and drink of his body. We take in his promises. But this morning, as we do that, there's going to be a guided prayer on the screen. And that guided prayer is going to take you into asking the Spirit of God to move your heart personally into offering the thing that we're celebrating to the world who doesn't know it yet. Let's use this communion experience to beg our God for men, women, and children to come home. Father, let your kingdom come. We'll feast at the table of the Lord. I will feast at the table of the Lord. I won't hunger anymore at his table.
church said amen Amen. y'all stand up with us I want to encourage you to not run off Uh, there's two people that I want you to to come and uh, give them a hug and and have a conversation with I want to encourage you to to come uh, hang out with Holly and Spencer and just welcome them as we go May you love your God with all that you are. May his spirit change our hearts to the very core. And may we love the things that he loves. Men, women, and children in our world. Until next week, let's walk together and make a difference. I know he has a place for me. Oh, what joy will fill my heart with the